Welcome to the Rare Book Room. My name is Nick and I help direct the events here at The Strand. For a bit of history, The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, The Strand is now the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. Under Nancy, The Strand is not only surviving in an increasingly competitive and unsure environment, but it is thriving. The Strand continues to famously hold over 18 miles of used, new, and rare books, and now hosts nearly 400 events a year. In large part, that is thanks to all of you. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today, so thanks. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome freelance writer and editor at The New Inquiry, Malcolm Harris. I heard a clap. Yes. <laughs> You can come out. You can come out now. That's fine. Uh, so I'm going to go through the rest of the intro now. His work has appeared in the New York Times, New Republic, Book Forum, The Village Voice, and N Plus One. His first book was Kids These Days: The Making of Millennials, which I hear is very good. His latest book, Shit Is Fucked Up and Bullshit, launched today. Joining Malcolm in conversation is Martin Hegland, professor of comparative literature and humanities at Yale University. He is the author of four highly acclaimed books, and his work has been translated into 10 languages. He was elected to the Harvard Society of Fellows in 2009, awarded the Schuch Prize by the Swedish Academy in 2014, and received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2018. His most recent book, This Life, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom, was published last year by Pantheon. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Malcolm, Martin, and Shit is Fucked Up and Bullshit to the Strand. He did warn me that I was gonna be a first applause and I should wait and came out on the second applause and I just didn't do it. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I'm gonna read for a little bit. We're gonna talk for a little bit and then we're gonna have some Q&A. Thankfully, I, I don't have to convince you all to buy the book because you were forced to upon conditions of entrance. Thank you, Strand. Thank you all for coming. Um, and reading Fucked Up and Bullshit. So I'm gonna give you the intro so you can skip that when you read it yourselves, and then I'm gonna read a piece about housing. It should be pretty quick. Introduction. The earth is extinguished, though I never saw it lit. Samuel Beckett, Endgame. The writing collected here spans the period between the summer of 2011 and the fall of 2019, between the birth of the Occupy movement and the midterm survival of the Trump regime. In the first piece, in terms of when it was written, on the rhetoric of the 2011 IKEA catalog, I quote Thomas L. Friedman, who summed up the feelings of the moment. Things will slowly get better, unless they slowly get worse. We should know soon, unless we don't. Wall Street put a gun to the nation's head in 2008 and threatened to shoot. The government, paled up, the government paid up and bailed out the capitalists. It was clear something historical had happened, but not what or why. Plus, Historical things weren't supposed to happen anymore. While the established pundits struggled to make sense of the world, a new cohort of activists and writers emerged with a scavenged explanation, class conflict. The reason no one could figure out if America was in a crisis or out of one is because its effects were uneven and by design. This was heresy in a 21st century America where socialism had been disproven. We were taught to locate ourselves near the end of history's long arc toward justice. A you are here dot sliding along the asymptote between the way things are and the best way we could hope for them to be. And yet, stuff kept happening. Instead of providing a higher standard of living for everyone for less work, we saw technology in the market generating unimaginable profits for a tiny ruling class, while everyone else struggled a bit harder every year. Americans lost their houses while rents went up and speculator landlords left beds empty. The crowning achievement of the Obama administration was a compromised health care bill that secured the existence of a rage-inducing private system. Higher education, that great equalizer, drove young people and their families into tens of thousands of dollars of average debt and didn't supply the promised good jobs. It became difficult to shake the feeling that most of us were on a trajectory other than slowly better. 
Being in New York at the end of 2011 was the right place to be geographically at the wrong time historically. After I graduated from the University of Maryland in 2010, I moved back home to California and got a job off Craigslist at a new site focused on the quote unquote sharing economy. I had applied for a full-time gig with health insurance, but in a twist that would become familiar, wound up with a part-time remote contract that paid a few hundred bucks a week. For some months, I spent my spare time reading, watching Netflix DVDs, writing on my blog, and thinking about what to do with myself. When I told an advisor at Maryland that I hoped to write about ideas professionally, but outside academia, he laughed and said, are you independently wealthy, or do you plan to live off women? I resigned myself to grad school. Not wanting to get too comfortable back at home, and knowing I wouldn't be able to afford to live in the Bay Area, I planned a trip to the East Coast to try and find a place to live. The low level of commitment between remote worker and remote boss excused a move without warning, I figured, as long as I maintained internet access. At the same time, I had earned my first real publication. I stumbled on a new online magazine that seemed like it would be a good fit for my writing, and I sent the IKEA piece to their submissions email. On the other end of the address was the small crew that made up the new inquiry, principally publisher Rachel Rosenfeld and editor Rob Horning. They liked my piece and more of the material on the blog. When I visited New York, Rachel made me an offer. Move to Brooklyn, helped edit the new inquiry, and stay in her closet-sized extra bedroom for $400 a month until I found a permanent place. As anyone who's lived in New York in the 21st century knows, that's the kind of deal you can't turn down. I kept my other job, spent most of my time working on TNI, and starting to get to know the New York writing world. I got my medium-sized break in the spring of 2011 when the magazine N Plus One published an essay I'd written about the explosion of student debt called Bad Education. Based on research I'd done in college for a presentation I helped develop for a left-wing student group about the financial crisis and its connection to the university, that piece gave me something to point to when I was pitching book reviews or justifying my presence at magazine parties. Though it didn't turn into a bunch of highly paid reporting assignments, the strong reception of bad education, along with Rachel's insistence, convinced me that I wouldn't have to get another degree, degree to be taken seriously. Plus, none of the grad schools to which I had applied chose to admit me, which made it harder to attend any of them. The first Occupy Wall Street General Assembly was August 2nd, 2011. Occupation was the preferred tactic of the ultra-left student movement, which I had been a part of at Maryland. I had childhood friends who joined building occupations as part of the fight against tuition hikes at the universities of California, and I watched videos online of them being beaten and pepper sprayed by police. Students at the Rio Pedras campus of the University of Puerto Rico took over their school for real, leading the fight against austerity on the island. Some of us wanted more, bigger occupations outside the schools and into the public squares. Occupy everything was the slogan, and the plan was to never give it back. We didn't quite get to world revolution, but we got a lot further than almost anyone expected. Sometimes I fear that the most important thing I'll ever do with my life is fake a rock concert or lose a court case about my Twitter account. It's more of that in the book. My Occupy case lasted longer than the occupation, but it didn't stop me from working. At the beginning of 2012, the New Inquiry launched a $2 a month subscription digital magazine, and I left my job to edit full time. Well, I didn't leave so much as I informed my boss that he had neglected to renew my contract, and that therefore I didn't work for him anymore and was going to do something else instead. The first issue of TNI was fittingly based on the topic of precarity, the weak connections that increasingly characterize the employment relationship. TNI's readers paid my rent for three years, and it was an immense privilege as well as a ton of work. I got to edit an incredible set of writers, and I'm proud of the material we put out, especially prescient issues on drones, cops, weather, weed, consent, and borders. When it came to my own writing, TNI was a great place to grow, and a lot of the pieces collected here are from that period. I had the freedom to pick my own topics, and a top right editor in Rob, who was always willing to be patient and open-minded with me. Plus, publishers had started to send us review copies of forthcoming books. And when I could, I sold reviews and essays to other magazines and sites, and I started to build the relationships that would sustain me as a freelancer. My first dependable writing job came in 2013, when an editor I'd worked with at Boston Review, David Johnson, got a job at the newly launched Al Jazeera America, RIP, uh, and found a place for me there. 
For the first time since college, I had a regular column, which allowed me to respond to current events quickly and write the occasional low-stakes piece about redheads or sex robots. That's also in the book. Not the redheads one. Over the course of 2014, I wrote the first draft of the manuscript that would become my book, Kids These Days, Human Capital and the Making of Millennials, which expanded on the research behind bad education into a broader analysis of my generational cohort, though it wouldn't be published until November of 2017. At the same time, I kept doing columns for Al Jazeera and freelancing where I could. That was going well enough in 2015 that I could step back from paid work at TNI and focus exclusively on my writing. In the spring of 2016, I found out at the same time everyone else did that Al Jazeera America was folding. I was living check to check when, with no warning, my job disappeared. I panicked. The line between making it and not felt incredibly thin, and suddenly I was on the wrong side. I reached out to other editors and planned to leave New York City, which was getting more expensive faster than my wages were increasing, a process I had contributed to by moving there in the first place and paying those ever-escalating rents for as long as I could. Luckily, Ted Scheinman at Pacific Standard came through with some steady work, but I still moved to Philadelphia in the summer of 2016. Pacific Standard has now also shut. Selling my book and moving to a cheaper city gave me the breathing room to work on longer, more substantial pieces, which are the ones that pay better anyway, provided you can work for a month or two without, without getting a check. I got to report some stories, and I placed my first real feature with the New York Times Magazine. It was about furniture startups that targeted millennial buyers, and it was published on November 10th, 2016. Yikes. I'm not even sure I read it. At least I don't have to blame myself. I may be a communist, but I still voted for Clinton. The situation has gotten much worse since a guy called Mickey Smith brought a sign, that's not me by the way, it's a guy named Mickey Smith, brought a sign that said, shit is fucked up and bullshit to Zuccotti Park and Occupy Wall Street, and the whole world knew what he meant. Like everyone who cares at all, I've struggled with the question of what the hell I'm supposed to be doing if I can't stand the few continuing to ratchet up their exploitation of the many. It's been amazing as a leftist in America over the past decade to see so many people shift in that direction. And at the same time, we have to know it's in large part because things have gotten harder for most of them. By any metric you want to use, the exploiters are tightening their grip on the exploited at an astonishing rate. How much is there left to squeeze, and for how long? After Occupy, I didn't stop doing political work, but I did separate it from my writing. I joined politically oriented volunteer collectives politically oriented volunteer childcare collectives, excuse me, first in Brooklyn, then in Philly. There's a whole network of them, it turns out, check them out, and there's very little ego or debate involved in the work, which was a relief. But I'm less interested in what it means for us to do our part than where we are, how we got here, and what it is that needs to be done. This collection pulls together my best attempts to process and understand the events of this period as they occurred. I want to put this writing in its proper context, personal, historical, political, but there's never just one. Perhaps the most important thing I can say is that I wrote most of the pieces for money, most of which I spent on rent. I start the collection with an essay about what I see as an acute emergency situation for caring people in America, a breaking point. Then I jump back to 2011, beginning of the shit is fucked up and bullshit era, when it started to become clear to more Americans that the 20th century narrative of progress unto the end of history was, itself, more history. If the title of this book speaks to a phenomenon you already recognize intuitively, then I hope the contents help clarify how and why, and maybe even point to a way for things to be otherwise. And if the title doesn't make sense to you, yet, it will. That's the introduction. All right, why don't we move on, why don't we move on to Q&A, or our talk, because we want to make sure we've got enough time for the audience, too. Yeah, great. Uh, can everyone hear me? Um, uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, discussing this book with the very family-friendly title. Uh, in fact, I was taking the subway here, and it's the first time I've ever taken the subway in New York. And I was like, why is everyone looking at me with such amused interest? I was like, am I wearing something? Or like, am I looking happy? And I realized I'm standing with this title uh, on display to the whole subway carton. So, so you know, I did some promotion before we got here. Um, and I'm really delighted to be in conversation with Malcolm, whose uh, writings I've admired for uh, a long time. And uh, I mean, one thing that I want to start out by saying is I think one thing that's very 
contributes to Malcolm being a very important and unique writer is the way in which he really integrates a very profound understanding of Marx's critique of political economy in analyzing some of the most salient features of our contemporary life. Uh, and uh, fortunately, he doesn't do this with heavy-handed jargon. Uh, I mean, he sort of sees and explains the world as a Marxist, but he doesn't sound like many Marxists do, uh, and that's a real virtue. And uh, the first book that Markham published that he mentioned, Making New Millennials, um, pursues this sort of analysis by, by asking, uh, you know, thinking about what it means to be a generation and how we should understand the gener generation we call millennials. And why we shouldn't understand it primarily in terms of sort of the moralizing analyses that often happen, but instead understanding it in terms of like the mode of production. If you're a millennial, how do you make a living? Uh, and how do the requirements, how you can make a living sort of transform and shape how you understand yourself and your relation to others and the world you live in? Uh, and especially like, what does it mean that we have to understand ourselves in terms of human capital and what does that do to, to ourselves and our social relations? Uh, so I wanted to just start off by if you could say a little bit how you see the relation between the two books, because the first book is really a very systematic study of the production of the millennial re uh, generation. And, and this is a book, a collection of essays that ranges across a lot of materials, but still has that optics of really wanting to understand the world we live in in terms of the fundamental critique of political economy. So we could start there. Yeah, I mean, the biggest difference, honestly, from, from where I was coming from is the, like, who I wrote it for and why, right? So the, the book I wrote because I sold the idea for it to a radical publisher for $5,000. Um, and I said, I'm gonna write this book in a year. I'm gonna take, the, they had been interested in the work I was doing about student debt and stuff. And I said, I'm gonna expand this concept. I'm gonna write this into a book for a year. Uh, that's where the book came from. Um, they didn't end up publishing it. It ended up being a like, longer deal. I ended up getting paid more for it, thank God. Um, but that was the, those were the, the terms under which I produced that book. The work in here uh, is way more chaotic in terms of how I ended up producing it. So some of this is like, I needed to make rent that month, so I wrote this piece uh, because I had to think of something quick because uh, my editor needed a thousand words and I wrote a thousand words about sex robots. And like, I still think that piece is like valuable and important, and I think that uh, it's worth including in this collection that I got to choose, basically, what's in it. And so I still think that matters. But the, the terms under which I produced it is very different. But then I also have pieces in here that I wrote because of the political situation, because you know, uh, there's a piece in here about fascism that I'd never sent to any editors that I just wrote on medium.com like any schlub who's not a professional writer um, and just posted because the political situation seemed so urgent to me and I had to get these ideas out and like to the people and to the public and to anyone who would read them as soon as I possibly could because we're in like a emergency political situation um, and I didn't get paid a dollar for it and I'm not sure how that reads. Uh, so far, people have said that it's very it seems very cohesive, which I appreciate because uh, it was my life and it felt like cohesive from that perspective because I was living it and doing it every day. Um, but the terms under which I was producing all the stuff in here are really varied. It's not like one thing. Um, but yeah. one thread is also the way you're using your sort of personal biographies to exemplify some of the issues. In the book, I mean, people could tell that already from you reading the introduction, but do you want to say something about how that organizational principle plays into the book? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a lot less than I've been lucky, sort of, I feel like, in that a lot of writers my age from my cohort have had to sort of exploit their own experiences uh, in order to publish. And I've been lucky that I haven't actually had to do that that often, that most of the stuff in this, most of the material in here doesn't use I, um, I'm trying to think like almost almost any of it uh, except for like personal like I think this or whatever it's not about me or my life or my experiences so much except for that it provides the the foundation for how I'm understanding these things um, at the same time if I'm writing about like millennials and housing obviously I'm writing about like myself also a millennial who needs to like live somewhere um, and so I try to be mindful of where where my perspective is in the book, uh, in the analysis that I'm doing. 
but also I, I think I'm, I'm happy and lucky that I didn't feel I didn't need to foreground like first person experiences or even in the first book, which is all about young people and people who uh, are in my cohort that I didn't have to say like, and or like, like someone like Ross Douthat or whatever who writes his first book about going to Harvard and how he felt about going to Harvard or whatever. For a lot of young writers, your first book, uh, Anna Wiener's uh, Uncanny Valley that I just re reviewed for the New Republic, for example, it's another writer about my age. And uh, a okay. lot of first books, you have to sort of exploit the, the useful experience that you had, which I, I'm really lucky I didn't have to do that. Yeah, and, and let's, uh Use a concrete example to give people just a sense of the sort of method you employ, which I think is very striking. I mean, you often take uh, one salient contemporary phenomenon and you use it as a lens to illuminate deep structural issues in terms of like value and labor and social relations under this epoch of capitalism. So I thought we could take this example. You have this great essay on the phenomenon of wage theft. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. As, as Malcolm points out, it's the largest property crime in America. I think it's something like 50 billion a year. Is that, if, if, that if that's what it says. Then yeah, 50 billion dollars a year. That, uh, so why don't you Everything first just explain, is because this is an amazing essay, and, and just explain first what the phenomenon of wage theft is and then we can talk a bit about what it tells us about who we are and who we have become. Um, yeah, I'll, that's an interesting essay. That was like, uh, when I was just coming up, I got assigned this really big feature about like wage theft for the New York Times Magazine, and I was like, I'm finally gonna make it, uh, and they ended up like not publishing it, and it like died, and it was really sad. Uh, and so this is the first place that it can be read, period, uh, which is pretty exciting for me. Uh, and so it's sort of unlike some of the other work in here because it's not analysis, it's actually a reported piece where I went to the Department of Labor and talked with their wage and hours enforcement division and I went to this, these private lawyers who were suing Apple for wage theft. Um, so the way, Apple's a good case because they just, the Ninth Circuit just ruled on this case that I wrote about you know, seven years just ago. Just to make sure that we, everyone knows what a wage theft is. So yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, tell, yeah, tell yeah. this is a part I'll tell. So, Wage theft is whenever the, your boss is stealing from you. And bosses steal more from workers than anybody steals from anyone all put together, period. The largest property crime in America by a long shot, which like sounds fake, but it's totally true. Um, and one way that you can, uh, that some people here might be familiar with, uh, commit wage theft is you make workers wait off the clock. So the way Apple was doing it was they said, oh, if you, you got an iPhone, like that's really cool. We're really for you having an iPhone. Uh, you got to register it with us, and every time we're going to check it. And we're going to check your bags, and we're going to check them on that when you come in, and check them when you, when you leave. But they did this checking process after and before they clocked in and out. So you're going to have to wait in line for a security guard at your job to check your bag that you brought to your work, and you have to pay for that on your time. Um, and I talked with the lawyers who'd been pursuing this case, um, and they actually lost this case after this, um, this article, and then went on to, to win it anyway, like last week or something, which is pretty crazy. Um, but that's just one of these many ways that, and what the piece really tries to get at is that this wage theft has become a really important quality of our employment relationships, that wage theft is like, increasingly important, and not just important, but characteristic of our employment relationships. That for employers who are encountering a situation where the rate of profit threatens to decline, uh, the place that they've found to pull money out of their, their firm is by pushing down workers' wages. And a really good way to do that, because it's incredibly hard to prosecute, uh, is wage theft. And so you have a situation where the government is totally outmatched. The government's uh, appropriation for wage theft, for the wage and hour uh, divisions, they're basically sort of like, like cops. And they'd go and show up at your workplace and they're like, hey, you, you're stealing. Like, that's stealing from your employee. Like, you're in trouble. Um, and I was talking to this woman, Maria Rosado, who's one of the directors in the New York office about sort of like how it works and how they do policing. Uh, from wage and hours, and it was so interesting to hear what policing looks like for bosses who are stealing for their workers as compared to like someone stealing a cell phone or whatever. Um, I was on a grand jury in, in Brooklyn for a while, so I know what 
stealing a cell phone looks like. Like you really go to jail for stealing a cell phone. You can grab some cell phone out of someone's hands and like the prosecutors will try to put you in jail. Um, if you're a boss and the wage and hour shows up to your you know, firm, they're not gonna like shoot your dog like the cops do. What they do is say like, hey, you know, we really gotta talk about this. This is an issue. And if they, what she told me is if they freak out, if the employer's like, fuck you, you know, get out of here, uh, whatever, they're like, I can tell you're upset. I think we should take care of this at a different time. You know, maybe give you a chance to calm down. We're gonna call your office in like a week. And seeing that and thinking about like, oh my God, what if the cops did that? They like show up at someone's and they're like, you know, got a gun pulled out and they're like, okay, it seems like you're upset. Why don't you take a week to cool down? We'll call you about that cell phone later. Like we know who you are, we know where you are. Don't worry about it. Like we'll work this out. Um, and it's just this totally different realm of justice. And so, so much of it gets left to these lawyers Whose, base, whose job it is is to attempt these cases, the civil cases where they're trying to get a return for the workers. Uh, but at the end of that, nobody's gonna go to jail. No one's gonna get penalized. And so you have a system in which the largest form of theft in this country by a huge long shot that disadvantages predominantly, you know, only, in fact, working people cannot be prosecuted as a crime. And the more I looked at it, the more it seemed that this, is, this was just part of the, the employment system that we have now. Even though it falls outside the technical rules, it's, it's characteristic. Right, because I take it that one of the underlying points there is also that actual wage theft is not accidental in relation to just a relation between employer and worker under capitalism in general and the sort of extraction of surplus values. So do you want to say something about that, the relation between you know, juridical wage theft and a sort of structural wage theft that is built into the uh, employer-worker relation. Yeah, any excuse to talk about that, right? Yeah. Um, it's funny, because uh, Martin's a philosopher, and so our, our like Venn diagram is, is not that overlapping, but it is this like, you know, five pages of, of Marx Capital Volume 3 that like the both of us are just really operating under. Um, Five pages, but. but like, but in particular, these five pages that I'm thinking of, um, which is that when profits go to overtime, the idea is that profits, the rate of profits, not profits, but the rate of profits for capitalists are going to decline, right? It's harder, and we've seen this, we can see this empirically now if we look at the, the stats. It's harder and harder for corporations to expand production at a profitable rate. Um, and so if you're a company, where are you supposed to find your profits? Uh, if you can't find them by expanding production? Well, one of the w things that Marx says and that what we've seen is that you lower your cost of labor but below the cost of reproduction, which means however good your life is, in Marx the idea of, of the cost of reproduction is just like how much it is to have a standard livable life in your society. That's the cost of reproduction. Just to, the, the, cost, the, the amount that it costs to live as a person in your society. And the way that they've found to hold profits, to make money as capitalists these days, is to push that number down. And so uh, there, was a, there was a big article today about the future of housing is $2,000 a month dorm rooms. Uh, and there's a piece in here about tiny houses. Tiny houses is a great way of reducing the cost of reproduction. They're saying, you know, you're going to basically live worse. Uh, and so if you're willing to live worse, then we can pay you less to do your work. If the cost of your reproduction is lower, then we, we're going to pay you less. And that's uh, increasingly like the mode of capitalist valorization, right? That's how they're making money, um, is taking it out of workers uh, on the margin, right? And so if you look at uh, hedge funds, for example, when a hedge funds take over a, a company, what was the, they just destroyed a chain of restaurants in California that people love called, uh, I think it's Curry House, the Japanese curry chain, um, beloved by the people. A hedge fund buys it and they said, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna make this as profitable as we possibly can. And the way that they do that is they basically ruin the business. They ruin its ability to reproduce itself, at which point they say, God, this, this really isn't working for us at all. We're gonna shut this down and walk away. 
and we've seen more and more of American life go through this same basic dynamic of capitalist churn, where instead of finding ways to reproduce the world in ways that are profitable for companies, they're just stripping the wiring out. Um, and a lot of the time that wiring is like our standard of living, right? And so that the wiring that they're stripping out of the, the house of capitalism as they're about to take off, because and there's good reason to suspect that like there's not a lot of time left in the house, right? Mm. Um, yeah. They're taking that right out of us. Exactly. And, but, and, but an important aspect, too, I, I think, of, of this argument that comes from in various ways in, in, in your work is that this uh, drive for profit also shapes how we intersubjectively relate to one another and how we see ourselves in terms of human capital. So even if I'm a benevolent employer, capitalist employer, and I employ Malcolm, you know, I can't, even if I want to, I can't treat your well-being as an end in itself. I have to treat you as a means for the end of generating profit, like human capital. Uh, and that means that like all the all the costs I have to put into you reproducing yourself and having some level of well-being so you can come to work the next day, all of that is a negative cost that I'm always trying to cut. Uh, and it's a lot of the consequences of that uh, relation to ourselves and one another in terms of human capital that you trace in the book. Yeah, when I was a kid and I read books about, you know, like, you know, 19th century books about the, like, you know, plucky, picaresque characters who are going out and making their fortune. There's always employers who look at you and you say, like, hey, you, young man, you look like uh, you're, really, you're really a go-getter. You look like you're working pretty hard. Uh, how about you come work hard for me? And I'll make your life easier, and in return, you're going to, like, make me money. And this was the idea about how, like, capitalism was supposed to work. And this was a a very specific, you know, for a very small group of people who were supposed to do all the productive labor for society. Um, you know, theoretically, I was supposed to be one of those people, at least based on 19th century novels. Uh, you grow up and suddenly you realize that no one's really checking for you like that. No one's really, like, seeing if you're doing a good job. And if they are seeing if you're good, doing a good job, it's not because they want to, like, invest in you. It's because they sort of want to pull out as much as they can as fast as they can. Um, and so on a, on a personal level, that was kind of jarring. And I think that, that historically uh, has definitely been a shift of the last 40 years, where we see the attitudes of firms towards investment in their employees change. Um, and this period coincides with what we might call like neoliberalism. It might coincides with the emergence of capitalism as a unipolar system, right? There's no like state socialism competing with capitalism, which I think we sort of underrate as a driver of phenomenon within our society. Um, yeah, so the, the, these, these sort of iron laws have become much clearer in the present day. So even someone like you know, Thomas Piketty, who's a, a sort of middle of the road democratic socialist or whatever, is talking about and getting people to understand and listen about these iron laws about how capitalism works that it's not about being a good capitalist or like being a nice boss because there's no such thing as a good capitalist. There's no such thing as a nice boss because they are themselves subject to these same injunctions that the rest of us are. Um, we don't have to feel, feel sorry for them or anything, but just like know that it's not up to them, which means you can modulate your expectations correctly. Yeah, and I think this brings us to an important uh, question for the, for the book. So we're at a moment when we see a revival of the left in America and various things that are being called critiques of capitalism and democratic socialism. But much of that is mainly focused on just the redistribution of resources. And uh, one of the points you make in the book is that that's insufficient to solve the deeper problems. So there's a, there's a in the first chapter you write following, uh, a fair distribution of resources is mostly moot when the mode of their manufacture is making the planet uninhabitable. Uh, so if you could talk a bit about what these deeper issues are that even though we, we shouldn't be against redistribution, but that won't solve our deeper problems, and, and, what, and what do you think that means for the uh, revival of, of the left in America and where it should be going? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about any sort of solution to the, the ecological crisis, uh, ecological means the whole world, right? So we don't have to say global ecological crisis, I guess. The ecological crisis that we're encountering, um, 
any solution that I think is based on further accumulation, further production, is a really bad idea. There's this uh, political theorist named Leanne Simpson that I talked to. Um, this piece is not in the book, but it's a, it's a different piece. But I talked to her. She's an indigenous political theorist from what we call Canada. Uh, she's an Ishnabe. Um, about what are, the, what are the solutions to global warming? And there are a lot of, and I, I have dear friends who are even scientists who work on these questions of decarbonization and how do we make the machine that costs the right amount, that'll do the right amount of decarbonization so that the graph numbers go the right way so that the science says we all live longer or whatever. Um, I understand that sort of technocratic approach about, especially when we're dealing with this question of the persistence of human life on Earth or whatever. Uh, but I think it's fundamentally misguided. And talking to Leanne Simpson and understanding that indigenous uh, political groups have had critiques of accumulation societies based on this line of like, if you keep doing this, this is going to all go away. Like, this is not how it works. You have to re reproduce things as you go. You can't just extract and accumulate. And we sort of like, as a culture, we've treated that sort of as non-overlapping magisteria is a, is a phrase that people use to sort of accommodate religion and science. And they say like, oh, these things can both be true because they don't really affect each other. And I think that's sort of how we've treated indigenous political theory when it comes to questions of climate change is like, oh yeah, that's true. We need to be like, you know, one with the earth and we need to think about ourselves responsibly. Uh, but that's like non-overlapping with our decarbonization plan that we have to do. We also have to do all this, you know, a trillion dollars of investment, five trillion dollars of investment, 17 trillion. I can't remember what the number is actually supposed to be, but it's like tens of trillions of dollars of investment in building solar panels. And like, where are you going to put those solar panels when they break? Okay, well then we've got to have a like solar panel pit. Uh, and now nobody can live in the solar panel pit, and no one can live in any of the areas where the water is connected to the solar panel pit. Um, and they're doing this, uh, there was an article that I was just writing about for wind turbine uh, blades. The wind turbine blades are built to be indestructible because they gotta be on the fucking wind turbine for like years or whatever, and so they hit stuff and not break. The problem is then you can't recycle them. And you can't break them down or use anything. And so they have these, these uh, they look like, you know, whale graveyards. These just huge these bulldozers, just tons, stack, 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 stack of windmill blades. And then you just cover it with earth. And like, that is not a solution. That is not a path towards a solution. Uh, just because that is the current limits of our political imagination as a like settler colonial state that doesn't mean it's the solution. And it's, I think it's really not. And we have to look towards uh, non-accumulation based political ideologies, um, which includes a number of indigenous theories. It includes communism, um, in my mind, certain kinds of communism. Uh, and there's, there's an important uh, Marxian lesson here, too, just in terms of how we tend to think about value, because in terms of the divergent criteria we're mentioning, we tend to think about, well, yeah, of course we value the earth and we value the environment and these things, uh, but in a way that is detached from how we, how we actually value things in practice is separate from how we actually reproduce our lives and how we make a living. And unless we can integrate, you know, what our professed values are in terms of how we actually practically reproduce our lives, we're going to be stuck with all of these contradictions. So that's an important. Yeah, and that, that value, the, the monetary value, the way we're uh, counting value these days, uh, it all goes away very fast. I mean, if you look at what's happened in Australia, uh, all that value you accumulated can go in a wink of an eye if you don't know how to maintain you know, the ecology around it. And so the idea that we're, we've really produced this stuff and that we can count on the things that we've produced to be there tomorrow, uh, if we look around, we should know that that's not true, that the, the, our ecological crisis puts the idea of accumulation itself into question. Um, and that's good, because we can have other answers. We can have a like, life worth living in, a world worth living in that has nothing to do with that kind of valuation, that has nothing to do with profit or exploitation. Um, in fact, I think we must. I think that's the, the, the choice we face is between those two things. Um, 
there's no way to integrate them. And this is also an important contrast to uh, traditional socialist critiques of capitalism, which then opposes a capitalist economy to a sort of planned capitalist economy, mm. uh, which won't solve these fundamental problems. And one of the ways you exemplify that very ingeniously in the book is in your chapter on Amazon mm. as a planned economy, actually. We think about this great capitalist enterprise, great. Uh, uh, but it's actually practicing a form of planned economy. And you, do you want to speak a bit to that? Yeah, I talk about like uh, Jeff Bezos has Stalin a little bit. Um, and not just in the way that he's an authoritarian, but that the plan for Amazon has not in the past been about profits. It's just been about revenue. So they're just trying to scale up. Every, any sort of money they make, they just put it into scaling up. And if they've got, like they literally, one year they had like $17 billion left over, and so they spent $17 billion to buy Whole Foods. And that was like literally the cost of Whole Foods was like exactly how much cash they just had on hand at the end of the year. And they're like, ah, fuck it, we're doing groceries now. Um, and that has involved driving profit out of some of these spaces. So Amazon is, is one of the, the machines that's driving that rate of profit down um, in the way that you would also under a planned economy, which is you're driving the, the, the labor costs of goods down. Uh, the problem with that that we have saw in socialist planned economies, but that we also see in Amazon, is that then you start to look at people as costs to reduce. Uh, and so Amazon implemented a, a like national minimum wage, right, for Amazon workers. They acted as if they were this sort of national body, and they said $15 an hour. And of course, it doesn't apply to non-traditional Amazon workers. Uh, but $15 an hour for all Amazon workers. You think like, oh, that's actually that's been a like progressive demand for a long time. Uh, but the thing is, Amazon doesn't tell you what they are going to make you do for that $15 an hour. $15 an hour can actually be a decrease in standard of living, even if it's technically a raise, if what they're able to do is pull more than that value out of you during that time. And Amazon has gotten incredibly good at doing that, of bending people into the right shapes. Uh, if you read any article about working conditions at Amazon, and I mean even up to the like executive level, every single article about working conditions in Amazon talks about using the bathroom. Every single article has, talks about peeing and how oh we got to pee in these buckets or like we pee behind I pee behind the the wheel of my delivery car or like under my desk. Um, you know some of these people are making six figures or whatever, and some of these people are making fifteen dollars an hour. But what Amazon has done is calculate for all of them how they can drive them to the very edge uh, of what their needs are so, as a human being. Yeah. So a very important lesson here then has to do with that how to tell if a system is capitalist or not is not necessarily whether you have a free market or a planned economy. It precisely has to do with how we think about cost and gain. And if we think about cost of our own well-being and flourishing as ultimately cost to be reduced, uh, and hence of ourselves as human capital, we're going to end up with all of these structural problems that you're, that you're tracing on various levels in our social life. So that's really uh, one of the lessons that we need a conception of value where, where you know, the, what is required for our own well-being and flourishing is not a ne negative cost, but actually what we are committed to uh, enhancing and cultivating. Yeah, and that's in, in contrast with a sort of like Polanyi, 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 uh, vision of like, well, what society should do is provide like basic goods to everybody for free, and then the rest of it will figure it out. It's like it doesn't really matter because as long as everyone has the basics covered, then like, whatever society we live in can't be that bad because you can always just like go back to your basics and and chill. Um, and I think that's basically wrong. That a, a system that's based fundamentally on exploitation as its mode of value production. Um, is going to be characterized by exploitation, period, no matter how, you know, if healthcare is free in the society. It's like, well, healthcare is free so that you can go back to work and make money for somebody else, because that's the only way the whole system operates. And so that's what's going to be based on, um, is and this monetary, yeah, reproduction. 
And, and one thing I want to say before we open up for questions is just that sort of argument, which uh, can sound relatively schematic and abstract, thusly stated. One of the amazing things about reading Malcolm's essays is that just in a very textured and vivid and concrete way, you all of a sudden start to like, oh, so that's why things are so fucked up uh, in our daily life because of these it, because of these dynamics. But you get a very uh, texture and fine-grained and concrete account of how the, these, these problems play themselves out in how we actually think of ourselves and our, our relations and how we work and how we have leisure and, and so on. So that, that's really, you, you just can enter into an understanding of our contemporary life that is informed by these marks and insights, but that doesn't beat you over the head with them, but let them emerge through the materials. So uh, that's one of the many reasons to, well, to thanks, read the book. Thanks, Martin. See, this is why I brought him here, to say, to say <laughs> nice marks. Uh, but I think we should open it up for uh, questions, because it's great to have interaction with the audience. So. We've got a, a mic in the back there. Just raise your hand. Somebody's got to raise their hand. I just had a quick question. You said the, uh, the wage theft piece uh, was not published by the New York Times Magazine. Uh, why did they not publish it, and did you get paid for it? Um, so, <laughs> they, they stealing it? so it's a that's an interesting question. Uh, I, you know, I try to you. You've, it's hard to balance transparency as a freelance writer because on one hand you want to like tell everybody about your working conditions, and at the other hand you like don't want to like complain in public to your like editors about your like working conditions because honestly I'm really lucky to be here at all, right? Um, and they know that which is kind of one of the problems. Uh, so That's that, a form of exploitation. Yes. Uh, it got cut because pieces get cut all the time. Part of the problem with this is that the case I was following, this Apple case, again, just got decided by the appeals court literally last week. And this essay is from like six or seven years ago or something. Um, and then if you don't have a staff job, I can't, I can't just pursue that story that whole time. Um, when a reputable publication uh, kills a piece, they pay what's called a kill fee. Um, for pieces like that, it was, I believe it was 20% of the assigned value or whatever, um, which sucks. It just sucks, that it, but it happens. Um, and that, that's definitely part of the job, and your hope is that you're able to assemble enough of these assignments, constantly keep them up in the air so that you can even when things fall through. Uh, and what I, what I should have done and would do now if I was in the same position is then take that essay to someone else and say, oh, the Times Magazine doesn't want, hey, the nation, how would you feel about an essay about wage theft, uh, which is what you're supposed to do. But there's no real class where they like tell you that. You like have to figure that out over time. And in, and in fact, they never even tell you, like, oh, by the way, like, this is done. They just sort of stop an answering your emails about a thing when, uh, at a certain point. Um, which is tough. It works hard these days. Uh, mine, no more than anyone else's, uh, but some people's, I guess. Yeah. But you wouldn't classify getting paid 20% for the same labor as a form of wage theft? Uh, no, because it's the contract that I signed in the first place, right? Uh, when you sign, when when a publication gives you an assignment, they every single, for every piece in here, I signed a. a uh, almost everyone. I signed a contract that says, we don't have to publish this if we don't feel like it. And in the event that we don't feel like it, here's what we're going to pay you instead. Uh, it happens. Right, because juridically, wage theft is, you know, demonstrable breach of contract. Right. It's not just exploitation in general. It's actually that you can demonstrably, like, extracting more than is contractually established. That's why it can be prosecuted. Yeah, but... Uh, 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 like you find out, it's never really prosecuted anyway. So uh, like any other worker, the way that you end up approaching these things is usually not about like the morality of it. It's very functional, right? You're like, OK, like, what's the best move for me here? I'm going to be pitching this editor again later. Is it, is it the best move for me to like, create problems here, or is it the best move for me to like, go away quietly? I'm sure you all deal with similar questions in your working life all the time. Maybe this testifies to my low expectations, but I was sort of amazed that there was even anyone who was actually pursuing these crimes at all. And even though they're not very successful, they bring back something like one billion of these 50 billion every year. Uh, maybe yeah, that's it's, it's the wage, wage and hour division is very effective at getting money back for American workers, and we could fund them way more than we do now. So that's uh, an important point. Very easily. Uh, we choose not to. Congress chooses not to. They could just get you more money every day. 
Uh, have you explored how unionization and internship play into this? question was uh, unionization and internships play into this dynamic. It's a good question. Um, there's a bunch in here. There's a fair amount, I guess, in about uh, internships, which is another way of creating a, like, for a while, that was wage theft because there was no rule on the books. This is, God, it's so fucked up. There was no rule on the books saying, like, oh, if you give people credit through their college, you don't have to pay for it pay them for their internships, even though that's what they told like every single person. They're like, oh, you're getting college credit. We don't have to pay you. Right, you're paying you in college credit, whatever. That loophole, they just pretended there was a loophole in the law, in the, uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act, that said that you were allowed to do that. There was absolutely no such loophole. Uh, and the, when the Department of Labor's Hilda Solis under Obama sent a letter saying like, you guys know that's not a real thing, right? To all the colleges being like, you guys like don't, tell people that they don't have to be paid for their work, like minimum wage is real. Um, and all these college presidents got together, the presidents of NYU, the UC system, all these presidents wrote this big open letter saying like, how dare you? Like, yep. this, is, this is education here, like this is not for you. And what the Department of Labor ended up doing a little bit later is just creating the loophole that they had pretended existed the whole time. And so now that loophole really does exist, and it's not wage theft, and you can give an internship uh, for credit. And so that, that worked. That was a good move for them. On uh, unionization, this is one that I sort of got wrong um, for part of my writing, in that I thought the, like, the anti-union forces were just sort of like too strong that we wouldn't see any sort of uptick that it would just go down. Um, and that's been incorrect. There's been uh, a level of political consciousness developed around unionization in workplaces, especially around young people, that I sort of didn't see coming quite in the way that it did and has led to, especially in the media industry, rapid increases in unionization and now we just saw the first uh, Kickstarter union as the first like big tech union um, and so yeah part of that has to do with like proletarianization we have people who used to have white collar jobs realizing that like that term doesn't really mean anything anymore and that they need to have labor organization to represent them um, so that's what I'm sort of happy to be have been wrong about in kids these days um, uh, on the internship question, though, I want to make a plug for, for Malcolm's first book because it has a long and extensive analysis of the internship phenomenon. Yeah, that's in the that first is, book. Read the first Yeah, that's really worth reading. So. Hi. Um, when, you, when you mentioned that you got something wrong, I was interested. Um, <laughs> is, there, is there anything else that you've kind of like changed your thinking on over the course of the you know, 10 or so years that uh, you were writing the essays in this book? But I just said it. That was, that was my good one. I, and I, like, I, I know I'm wrong about this. Um, yeah, I, I've changed my thinking about uh, a lot of stuff. And yet, the, I think the fundamentals are still there. Um, con the, the political consciousness shift, I think, um, has m seemed to matter more than I thought it was going to in terms of how groups have been able to organize themselves. And so I had sort of given up at some points in this you know, 10 year sequence on the idea of uh, formal institutional organizations. Just that I thought it was like that time has passed and we're gonna see like occupations and riots basically is what's going to characterize this political engagement. And I still think that's true to a pretty large extent um, but not as true as I thought it was at the time. And so I'm interested to see how, what these institutions are going to look like as politically left-wing, politically conscious young people uh, get control of some of them. At the same time, that has been overstated by other parties, right? Uh, by the media a little bit. There's still serious issues in terms of like, if you don't have capital, if you don't have land, your ability to affect politics in America is somewhat limited. Uh, and our cohorts and the, our allies within other age cohorts 
don't have those kind of resources, and it's really tough. And if you look at the, the history of leftism in America, a lot of the funding came from outside America. And the, the Chinese Communist Party is not going to fund us, you know. The North Korea funds the World's Workers Party, but only, you know, that's it. And they're not a, really useful. Uh, so we're still, we're still in trouble resource-wise, but yeah, I think I've been a little more optimistic about our ability to organize. Um, but maybe that'll, maybe that'll change, all, could also change as we see repression kick up again, so. But that's something I'm wrong about. Hey Mal, um, really excited to see the book, content, Table of Contents, firstly, just because my favorite essays of yours, a lot of them aren't there, so I know this book is exciting, and then there's like material for accumulation in the future. Um, I wanted to ask you about automation. So you talked about accumulation and revenue, and I, I love how Amazon is like just the perfect bogeyman or example for just about anything, any part of this conversation, and I'll bring them up again. And um, there's a, an Engels essay from the end of the 19th century about authoritarianism in which he outlines how automation is worse and more violent extractively than the worst small despot. So the kind of mm -hmm. like small merchant or the boss or the capitalist, like he, he's so bowled over by what he finds in these steamship factories where the minute one vein of the piece of work from one part of the steamship factory to the other breaks or someone has to go pee and take a bathroom break, the entire thing is like grinding to a halt and not in a way that favors the worker, right? So I'm just really curious in and, and, and the best example of this recently is like something like Lyft and Uber and some of the sexual assault crises that happen where it's, you know, the idea of like platform capitalism, that it's the platform that is creating um, the, the, automa the automation itself is helping usher in like violent um, algorithms, right? Um, I just wonder how you, how you frame or reframe automation in the context of of what you've um, what you've come to, or how you re envision capitalism with automation? Yeah, uh, someone whose work I, I really recommend is Aaron Beninev, um, who's been doing really important empirical work on automation. Uh, he had a couple essays in the New Left Review, and one in the Guardian recently. Um, and I think what he found what he finds is really important, which is that automation isn't working the way we think of it as working, which is just like replacing workers with machines that do our job for us automatically, um, but that it's driven uh, underemployment. And so rather than getting rid of workers, what it's actually done is the, the machines have been, have effectively, like we were talking about earlier, shifted the cost burdens to workers. So what you're talking about, a, a good way to see a variety of current uh, factory floor labor, I find, because you don't, not a lot of television shows where they're like, here's what it looks like working at this factory. And the one t TV show that does do it is called Undercover Boss. Um, people see an Undercover Boss. It's where they, they have the, the boss of these companies goes undercover on the production lines, basically, of whatever the company is. Um, and what they find every single time is that they absolutely cannot do this work. Like not the, and it's all about speed and it's all about speed that they cannot keep up with and that uh, appears basically superhuman to them. And all of these production line workers who are looking at this like new person on the line and are just like, yeah, like the whole system will shut down if you work like that. Like you have to be able to work like this. And the way that people are working is so much more machinic than we've seen in the past um, because not because we haven't had production lines in the past, obviously, but because where the investment has been in these past years has not been in expanding production, right? It's been on driving the costs of labor lower. And so they've been making workers more and more efficient. And if we think about automation as the increasingly efficient, making efficient of workers as opposed to their replacement, uh, by machines, we get closer to what's actually going on, which is this increasing underemployment. And so instead of seeing that, like when we go to CVS and you see the automatic checkout machines or whatever, and you see five automatic checkout machines, and you're like, wow, they just automated those jobs away. Uh, and the truth is no, you've still got one or two cashiers like you would have before, except now their job is to take care of those machines. 
and they have to be, that, that is way harder. And you watch people just, you gotta be running around constantly, you gotta be like real fast on the keyboards, uh, and your job is they such that, yeah, they talk back at you, you have to, you have to be like not be driven crazy by having to do this. You, uh, you are also shifting costs to customers very effectively. So now the customers are, uh, have to figure out how the, the machines work in conjunction with the employees. So now the employees are responsible for like teaching and coaching employees through the use of these checkout machines. Um, and the more you think about it, the more you're like, that's not automation. That's not a machine doing a human's work. This is changing the human's job to make it harder, basically. And the machines are able to do that. Um. Uh, Melissa, I work here, and I requested this event. Um, yes. I'm awesome. I appreciate you being wrong about unionization, um, or union, union shop. Union shop, but right I, here. I do want to ask one question. Um, do you feel that there is still a level of generational resentment about the economy crash that fuels a lot of the organizing that's happening right now? That's a good question. I don't think it's... I've been actually surprised by, or maybe not surprised, uh, I think some people would be surprised by the political generosity of the millennial cohort, especially the like left wing of the millennial cohort. Um, so people in, I'm constantly hearing from young people like, well, isn't that generational critique is just too harsh? I mean, like, you know, there are lots of poor old people too, and they're in it with us, and like, that's how, and that's not really what generational analysis is about. Um, it's about the, like, the structural differences between these, rela we, structural relationships between these generations. Um, and so we're not saying like, all old people is bad, are bad, like literally no one is saying that. In fact, Millennials tend to be really thoughtful about how age works around poverty, um, even though the current group of elderly Americans is the richest cohort that has ever existed. Um, you still have, for example, my favorite stat, and this is from the first book, is that the average millennial household will pay over the course of their life a million dollars into Social Security, which sounds kind of like impossible until you think about that you have to like work for like decades in your life. Um, which is a bummer, uh, pay on average, a millennial household will end up paying a million dollars into Social Security over time. The average millennial expects to get zero dollars back of that million dollars. And yet, support for Social Security among millennials is very, very high because they understand the basic uh, idea of it. They understand the fairness of it and it speaks to their political values, even though that means for them just as far as they understand, and they probably will get some social security money back, probably won't get literally zero, depending on the state of the state. No, actually they're probably right. Um, and so the fact that young people, you know, as a group are willing to just throw away that much of their money towards old people who they imagine to be in need of it, and in many cases are in need of it, uh, I think speaks to, they're not being, a, it speaks to the resentment being better targeted than that, right? I think it is uh, really smart in a lot of ways that they, I've been really happy with the, the rise in millennial political consciousness because it is, I think, really sharp and analytical and it's not careless or blunt. Sometimes I wish it would be a little more careless and blunt, uh, but people are very circumspect about thinking about who they're talking about and uh, what the situation means for people with lives very different from theirs. So once again, Malcolm Harris is the most eloquent defender of the millennial generation. There so you go, right? I, I'm <laughs> here. Martin, Malcolm, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, we will go ahead and transition into the signing. As I mentioned before, we might need a couple minutes for that. But in the meantime, anyone who has a book, well, first order of business. If you need the restroom, you can cut through this exit door.